fascination for trees and wooded landscapes and this is the kind of thing that people get excited about it's a wonderful veteran oak probably 600 years old or so at Chatsworth Park on my doorstep in the Peak District and 2003 it was not actually 2004 it was the 2003 conference we took Oliver Rackham out to Chatsworth uh, the late sadly late Oliver Rackham um, and everyone assembled under one of these great trees and actually Oliver headed up the hill to look at old hawthorns and he said to me nobody looks at these these are far more interesting and exciting but nobody pays them any attention and that was kind of where some of our ideas started and this hawthorn that you see in front of you sadly is also no more it died after the 2010-2011 winters it was at Longshore in the Peak Park, and it was probably the oldest living thing on the Longshore estate at that time. And they are incredibly difficult to age because they hollow out in the middle, along with um, rowans, which is another tree that we're very, very interested in, these small veteran trees. Hawthorns and rowans rot in the center, we think brought on by stress, and they're cleverly recycling their innards in the way that Ted Green famously talked about with the great trees of Windsor Great Park, uh, when they hollow out, they're actually releasing nutrients from the dead part of the tree into the root plate, and they're taking it up inside the tree. And the other exciting thing with the rowans and the hawthorns is that they put down adventitious roots, which become shoots inside the dead trunk, and they kind of grow inside themselves so you cannot actually do a ring count a coring and age these trees they are amazing and this was a um a trigger for a journey quite a long journey to search for what we've called shadow woods lost landscapes don't try and write everything down because i'm going to cover far too much far too quickly uh, but there's a free download of the book uh, on my website so you can actually download that if you want it this is the main case study area that we have been dealing with, searching for these shadows and ghosts. And it's the Peak District and South Pennines. And you have this wonderful uh, set of escarpments and millstone grit facing from where I am facing west and on the Manchester side facing east. And it's this landscape here, which is carpeted with these uh, amazing shadows. A little bit of basic history, because I know you're not all historians, but the idea of 1066 and all that, something fundamental to the story is a shift from the fluid Saxon countryside to the fixed Norman feudal system. The Doomsday Book, William the Conqueror's uh, tax collecting account, um, catalogues the, the Saxon landscape. It tells us about what went before. And I've been very involved in discussions on rewilding and ideas of how Europe used to look. We'll come on to that in a second. But one of the things that surprises me is that ecologists and others, people debating these landscapes, never seem to look at the obvious, which in England is that Doomsday tells you what the landscape was like before the conquest. Then 1235, I know you've all got this date ingrained on your, brain, on your brains, the Act of Commons or Statute of Merton, which actually reflected the transition um, that was going on in the Norman feudal landscape and it establishes the rights of commoners, peasants, uh, landowners, and the aristocracy and the crown within the landscape. And it's a fixing of the fluid landscape into the more rigid feudal landscape. The other one, which again, if you're not a historian, you may not be totally familiar with, is the idea of the parliamentary enclosures, the 1700s to 1800s, completely turned much of the countryside on its head to create the modern countryside. Um, particularly in the lowlands. The lowlands are largely uh, wiped away through land improvement, land cleaning and conversion. The commons are taken from the commoner uh, and that is fundamental in what we actually see or what we don't see. The work we've been doing is cross-disciplinary work with historians, archaeologists and ecologists across the UK and across Europe and it's Looking back to origins, that's a view of Monsell Head in the Peak District. It's how I envisage the primeval landscape with mature trees and dense woodland, but open areas, scrubby areas, successional habitat, fantastically flowery, species rich, wonderful landscape. And of course, we as ecologists derisively describe it as scrub. 
I have two things I'm really passionate about. One is scrub and the other are bogs. And I think, you know, I have a problem in PR with all these. But one of the issues was how did primeval Europe look and how can we understand that and how does that carry forward to some of our more current uh, ideas and questions. So key questions that we started with, one was evidencing ancient woodlands, the second was the European primeval landscape as described by Franz Vera, and then the idea of futurescapes and rewilding. Evidencing ancient woodlands came about with a national project with the Society of the Forest Commission and other players to try to find evidence, an evidence base, base for ancient woodlands to give the Woodland Trust and others uh, a toolkit to defend ancient woodlands against unscrupulous developers and their consultants trying to undermine whether an ancient woodland is ancient and therefore removing the tiny bit of protection it gets in the planning system. So we started to look at what indicators might tell you, for example, and bring together a range of different approaches, including landscape history, place name analysis, and other things, to tell you if your woodland was ancient, because the ancient woodland inventory was not developed for that purpose. It's not intended to be defended in a legal uh, court or jurisdiction, etc. So that was one thing that we tried to do. And what we found was that indicators took you back to the medieval woods. So we knew we were in ancient woods, but what they didn't do tantalizingly was that they didn't tell you about what was there before the woods. So they got you back to 1200 quite reliably in many cases, but not necessarily informing your understanding of what was there before. Now relevant to all this was the European primeval landscape as described by Franz Vera uh, and how that links to ideas of futurescapes and rewilding, which are now being debated. And this is the man, good friend of mine, Franz. People either love him or hate him. Um, I still meet people from Holland who kind of turn pale if I mention Franz Vera, or they turn bright red and get very angry. Um, but to many people, he's a bit of a hero. He came out with a, what proved to be a very controversial uh, theory that the European primeval landscape was open. Uh, in my book, I kind of describe some other ways that we can evidence it being open. And, that Franz isn't totally correct necessarily in it being large herbivores driving you, but he su suggested that large herbivores not only were in a European savanna landscape, he drove the successful changes in that landscape. And uh, this upset a lot of people who hadn't thought of that idea before Franz did. So there's been a big debate going on globally ever since. So a question, what we want to know is how does the landscape move from primeval to the modern day countryside? What are the processes going on? We want to know, you know, where are the species and when are the species, because all the plants and animals in the modern countryside had their origins in the past. They don't suddenly beam down today. They were there in the landscape, but where and when? And part of what we have to do is break down the shackles of landscapes being static and viewed in the way that we see them through a 21st century lens, but actually look at species as dynamic travelers through space and time. We're taking a case study approach uh, and obviously the Peak District and South Pennines is right on my doorstep, so this is where we've tended to concentrate and it's this area where we've looked, we've carried out field surveys, we've looked at botanical indicators, white cap fungi, which are fantastic indicators of wood pastures, ancient trees and small veterans. And it's this swathe between the Peak District, the core of the Peak District and Sheffield, the high ground. And we looked at soils, historical sources, maps, place names, sediment profiles, etc. And of course our Peak District is part of the, the southern end of the Great Pennines and that reaches all the way back up towards uh, Lancashire and Boland. And the questions that we have apply to what, I, mean, I went to Lancaster University and I just felt immediately at home, it's the same sort of landscape and the same questions arise about these landscapes that we see. Um, and they're described by people like Daniel Defoe as these great wild, barren, desolate areas. But one of the questions we had was, is what we see today, what was really there in the past? And the answer is quite clearly not. Uh, and I'll come on to why. But one of the issues that we're really interested in, woods and wood pastures. So we're very interested to know more about the early resource, the wooded commons, enclosed parks, chases and forests, the great hunting areas, and then enclosed woods and coppices. So this is what's there in the medieval landscape and what's there in the modern resource. 
ancient woodlands, abandoned coppice and replanted woods, plantations, spontaneous birch woods, scrub habitats, relic club woodlands, relic hanging woods on crags, relic wet woodlands, which are really, really exciting, alder woods and willow woods and parks. And we wanted to know about these shadows and ghosts in the early resource and how that relates to the modern resource that we see today. And it's worth thinking, what, you know, what do we get or what did people get from the common parks, woods and chase? Well, they had deer for hunting and for food and for uh, showing off to their neighbours. Pigs were very important in the medieval economy. Cattle were hugely important in these areas and sheep, boar and probably goats in some areas as well. These were hugely important landscapes. Some very basic questions. What is a wood? Well, a wood is enclosed from something earlier. Um, a wood is an enclosed coppice area, usually managed with coppice and with standard trees. And this is one on our doorstep at Longshore Yarn Cliff Wood, which means the urn cliff, the seagull cliff. And it implies that when this wood was enclosed, it was actually enclosed at a time when eagles bred, I like to think, on the nearby cliff. So it's been enclosed a long, long time ago. And that tree in front of you is probably well over 600 years old. We've done some dating on these trees um, in the Czech Republic, similar multi-stem trees, and they've come out to be over 800 years old, which is amazing. Because people look at those small stems and they think, oh, it's 150, 200 years old maximum. But all those are one tree, and in some cases, there are multiple, multiple stems in that bit of landscape. So what are these woods enclosed from? Well, they're enclosed from a wood pasture and we can find out a bit more about that as we go on. So we're interested in three types of woods, if you like, lost woods, are woods that were enclosed and then for some reason either being lost from memory or from maps or actually in reality, they've been removed. Ghost woods are what remains from some of these lost woods. These are the tantalizing glimpses through indicator species, occasional trees, wind or wood lane or things like that. And then we have these shadow woods which actually are not really woods at all. These have not been enclosed. These are wooded commons. These are a type of wood pasture. <coughs> and we have evidence for remarkable survival of what I call biodiversity time capsules through these shadow woods. These really are quite amazing and they are generally unrecognized and wrongly attributed ecological community. So it becomes quite exciting. Particularly if you go west to Cumbria, to Lancashire, into Wales, down into the southwest of England, all along the Scottish coast, all along the Irish coast, you get lots of these um, wooded common areas. And once you get your eye in, you can spot them everywhere. This is one that will be familiar to some of you, National Trust property at Godolphin Hill in Cornwall. The most amazing site. It's a huge noggin of a hill in the landscape, 360 degree view at the top, loads of archeology. span You can tell this is where ancient people settled um, in prehistoric times. But the hillside is this huge area of wooded common with gnarled, twisted oaks, ho hollies, hawthorns, rowans, and a carpet of wood and eminence, bluebells, stitchwort, honeysuckle and more. Absolutely gorgeous. And it's surrounded by a huge wall, a park boundary, and lower down there's a separate deer park area, which is the boundaries still remain, great big stone walls and uh, deer passes through the walls, and it's been converted to modern farming. So but the hill itself is this massive uh, enclosed medieval deer park. So these are the kind of things that we're really interested in. Doomsday, as I said, is, is one of those things it's, you have to read the, unless you've got good medieval Latin, you have to read a translation. Um, and it's not reliable, it's not specific to sight, it's not spatially accurate all the time, and it's not uniform in the way it's covered. It was a tax gathering ex uh, Doomsday England look like. And 1086 for Derbyshire, we have a description of thousands of acres of wood pasture, but very few woods. 252 manors are listed, 118 had wood pasture, only 35 had silver minuta coppice woods. Edale, near Kinderscout, had 13,000 acres of wooded commons, 20 square miles of wooded commons. Hathersage had 4,000 acres of wood pasture. 
And these uh, wood pastures, these former wood pastures have left ecological shadows in the moors, heaths and bogs, and these have been largely unrecognised. Get out up onto the moors and we see, start to see evidence of these amazing shadow woods. The one in front of us there is actually a willow car. And when you actually get into it, it's on the maps, on the surveys, this is down as Heather Moreland and Bog, and it's not, it's a willow car. And within that woodland, there's only a handful of trees. They're individual willows growing horizontally through the landscape. Absolutely amazing stuff. And no one's actually noticed this. And there are even proposals, they started to clear fell it to regenerate woodland. Absolutely amazing. And there are shared origins, these heaths, moors, bogs, fens, um, chasers, forests, etc. all come from a shared origin. And this is why they have species in common. This is why we are finding woodland species out on heather moorlands, because what we see as a heather moorland is a relatively recent phenomenon. And you can see the willows there. This is in one of these willow car areas. It just extends and extends. It's growing horizontally. It'll never finish growing. It's just the way that willows behave. And here's some other pictures, uh, some taken by uh, one of my students, James, and measuring the girth at breast height. Well, you know, try it on that. It's, it's just impossible. These things are growing horizontally. Um, a very eminent archaeologist working in Scotland has suggested that some of them uh, in the north may well originate from maybe seven or 800 AD. These are very, very old trees and no one's ever looked at them. This is Low Bar in Cornwall. And I've talked to the National Trust down there about it. They were very, very interested in this. It's just this amazing tangle, almost impossible to walk through because the bits in between the trees are actually deep and muddy uh, and you just cannot get through. But these trees just grow out and out and out. They're radiating out from a central point uh, and it is one single clone, that is one single tree, and probably much older than some of the big trees that we recognise as veterans. And in the lowlands particularly, this is part of a, a landscape transformed that I've described in Lost Fen, where the lowland areas, the huge areas of uh, lowland England were bogs, wet moors, wetlands and fenlands, and wet woodlands, and they've almost entirely gone in the lowlands. And it's trying to step back into that landscape to understand what, what it was about. Here you can see just up on the hill there, uh, there's a little bit of willow car. That's one of these woodlands. And then out down here, a little bit of a clough with old rowans and birches and uh, occasional hollies and lots of woodland indicators. This is in the southeastern corner of the Peak District. And it has a very rare plant called chickweed wintergreen, which is really... Um, an upland northern thing of northern uh, high forests and it shouldn't be here it shouldn't be it's not a moorland plant but when we start to look in more detail this isn't moorland this is actually uh, an enclosed wooded common and that's why that plant is there in its most southeasterly station. This is another one which is one of the woodlands that really draw our attention it's in triple SI it's in the National Park it's next to one of the most busy footpaths you can see people down here on the bottom um, in any recre recreational site in the country and no one had noticed that there's an ancient woodland. It ha has no name um, and it's hanging there on the crags. It's very uh, impoverished because it's had very heavy sheep grazing in it but these are the trees. These are magnificent. Again measure it at you know diameter breast height. It, these are growing over and under and clamped onto the boulders of the periglacial talus slope. They are amazing things, these multi-stem, what we call medusoid trees. And some of the just big lumps of wood that are hanging on there, uh, hacked and bashed probably by local commoners and forged by uh, extreme weather as well. And along with those uh, areas of holly, etc. Nearby we have Stanage Edge uh, and just a few old oaks hanging on to the cliffside there. Most have gone and there's my appropriately named colleague, Andy Alder, stood next to one of the old oak trees on there. And again, this is one of these relic hanging woods, absolutely amazing things. And down the same valley, all the way along the escarpment, we're finding ancient woodland indicators. Wherever they've not been nibbled away by the sheep grazing, they pop up. And we get things like wood sorrel and others. And you can see there, that's where the woodland was. Um, it's not marked at all. And then we come all the way down here to the National Trust, 
and there's no ancient woodlands mark but we're getting lots of ancient woodland indicators things like dog's mercury which on the acid soils of the dark peak is a very very good indicator it's a lousy indicator on limestone but it's a good indicator on the uh, the acid soils and some of these shadow wood areas very very depauperate it's heavily grazed it's desiccated we live in a, a desiccated world and these are the trees here the old trees are rowans birches thorns and where there is any water willows but get down your hands and knees there and it's full of bluebells and bilberry and stitchwort and honeysuckle and these are different and distinctive from the secondary woodlands which is spreading now quite rapidly in some areas in the peak and the, uh, the pennines and it, this goes to show you don't actually have to plant trees to get a woodland if you manage the processes on your site effectively you can get uh, secondary woodland and our birch was now changing into oak birch and they are starting to uh, acquire other species too. So there's things about future landscapes here. This is looking from the high ground um, just to the west of Sheffield down towards Chesterfield down the Cordwell Valley which is a gorgeous medieval valley of ancient woodlands, sunken hollowways, trackways and ancient hedgerows. And we're here above the upland limit of the enclosures, of the lowland enclosures, and this is one of our wooded commons. Our shadow was fantastic bluebell habit. These are the, the best bluebell sites you will ever see anywhere. They're not in woods, they are in wooded commons. And you can see there the unenclosed ancient wood pasture going up the hill, and then the blue line marks the boundary, the political interface, the ownership interface where the management changes. Above that, there's improved heather moorland. The enclosures in the 1700s gives you improved heather moorland. <coughs> and below that, the wood pasture is a lost doomsday landscape. The moorland enclosure there viewed from the other side, the open moor, the critical interface, and the wood pasture uh, above the farmland enclosures. Above that, 200 years of draining, burning, and sheep repeated every few years, draining, burning sheep, draining, burning sheep, gives you that moorland that we are familiar with. And these were the shooting moors. They were enclosed, the commoners were removed, but they weren't converted to farmland, they were convert, converted to grouse and sheep moor. And the interface there is really quite spectacular. Left-hand side uh, is a shadow wood with willow, and then on dry areas, rowans and hawthorns. Uh, and fantastic bluebell habitat. There's then the road and above it there should be um, the same. There, there's no ecological differences between the two sides of the road but in the, the medieval landscape we think it got more woody as you went downhill, more heathy as you went uphill. That's the boundary and it's uh, an interface. It's an interface of management. That uh, woody area should extend up the hill, the heathy area should extend down the hill. It doesn't, it's a very sharp boundary. So what we've been doing is gathering ecological data, uh, citizen science work, loads and loads of volunteers going out recording um, where they've recorded a list of indicator plants, dogs, mercury, great stitch work, climbing corridalis, oxalis, bluebell, etc. And we've trained them in workshops and then sent people out. This is one of the early maps. We've got lots more data since then. And also gathering data on trees, soils, white caps, written records, maps, etc. And what we're interested here, what we're interested in is where the indicators occur but not in woodland, wood and weren't in ancient woodlands in the past because this is where these shadows are. And of course Google Earth is a fantastic tool for this. Go on site and that's one of our willow woods. That's another one. You can see the almost like cauliflower type shape and that's that wooded common I showed you and the roads are those roads as the interface and you get this very sharp boundary but actually now we've got uh, data lots more data than i can show you today but we've got indicators all the way along here all the way along absolutely fantastic we can put up the indicators this is very early set of data there's a lot more dots on the maps now but the dots start to fill in where we think these shadow woods were, these relic wood pastures, these wooded commons. And the other thing is that these actual little trees that are marked, this is the 1800 six inch maps, these are accurate. The, the cartographer often actually marked the individual ancient rowans, 
oaks and hawthorns and some of these trees are still there so again really uh, fantastic uh, insight and this one was amazing because this is how it looked in the 1800s and this is how it looked uh, when we found it actually on site this was where we found it using indicated species and you can see there are almost no trees but then when we were doing the research it turned out that uh, it was actually a, a wood pasture tree landscape in the 1800s it's just that the trees are gone and the um, agriculture improver writing the county agricultural history uh, in 1811 fairy describes the removal of small trees by grazing animals so they note this landscape changing it's noted as being wood pasture but it's then converted into heather moorland so really quite amazing stuff and some of the trees that were really interesting people don't give a second thought the, the old hawthorns and you get to look at some of these and start to work out how old they have to be looking at tree form and veteranization etc and some of these are fantastic and they almost always sit on a, a carpet of bluebells and stitch work this is longshore which is a west facing slope of that uh, upland area we're dropping down off the high moor slightly and we've got this amazing landscape at longshore which has got 2,000 years, probably continuous grazing management, evidenced by the archaeology. It's just an amazing site. That oak tree that my friend is bowing to there um, is probably well over 500 years old. We've cored one some distance away on a different site, and that was smaller than that tree, and that was over 500 years old. These are growing incredibly slowly. They're much older than the big trees that were planted by the Victorians nearby, the sycamores, pines, and beeches. So that's a fantastic veteran tree. And Longshore is one of the most biodiverse sites for white scout fungi in Northwestern Europe. And this is a fungus that requires short grazed turf. So we think the landscape history is telling us about this amazing uh, land use over that period of time. Uh, and this is reflected in the biodiversity of the, the white scout fungi, absolutely amazing thing. And this is the uh, wonderful tree that we discovered at Longshore, the old man of Longshore and it's about these stems, it's got a double set of stems which then come up and then split into two and these are about a meter across, it's just a colossal colossal thing and the branches have been pulled down and laid in concentric rings around the outside so you've got a low flattened crown and no one had ever noticed it and we think what's happening is that this tree has been deliberately cultivated as a low growing broad canopy on the southwest facing slope to produce acorns for pannage. It's an acorn factory. So amazing stuff there. Uh, and it tells a story that we just were not aware of and all, all the evidence is coming back together. And again, that landscape is full of ancient woodland indicators, but you have to get on your hands and knees to, to actually spot them. Now this is another site uh, in the Eastern Moors, Leash Fen in the Peak District. And times past, I would probably be concerned about the ecological succession that's happening. The birch wood is spreading across parts of the site. And we'd have probably thought, mm, this is not necessarily a good thing. Um, you know, do we want that amount of scrub? But actually in the middle ground there, there's some willow car. And that willow car is probably several centuries at least in age. So that starts to give us a different perspective. And, What's happened to this landscape? We recognise it today as something with a few trees, but uh, we're finding more and more evidence that there were actually named woodlands nearby. Uh, and there are lots of woodland indicators across the area. And up to the 1970s, it was a fantastic site for black grouse. So the evidence is that this was actually formerly a much more treed landscape um, than we see today. It was much wetter and the wetness control where the trees were and the drainage is, is causing a problem so we need to re-wet these sites but there were more trees and, and it was patchy with open areas. So taking this approach we've done a lot of work with citizen scientists getting volunteers training them up um, and it provides enormous extensive habitats which should be misplaced or perhaps misclassified in systems and one of the things that we need to think about as I said earlier is breaking out of the the idea of the landscape and ecology being fixed that it's permanent that it's this is the this is the particular community that we should have 
um, the landscape in the past was much more connected, it was much bigger, it was more continuous, and it was subject to pulses. Now, this was explained very, very cleverly by Ted Green uh, from the Ancient Tree Forum in terms of great old uh, deer parks with their big trees. And what you tend to find is there's a handful of trees, <coughs> some like Sherwood Forest, a handful of trees about a thousand years old, a few more trees that are 800 years old, a few even more, 600, more still 400 years. And they come in batches, maybe 200 years apart, because that's when there was regeneration. And in between the regeneration, there's been grazing and no regeneration. So you get these cohorts. And the, the pulses are through things like war, disease, economic and political change, climate, etc. The disease might be black death, or it might be rinderpest taking out the cattle, it might be foot and mouth. These things change landscapes and they create pulses. Now, if we take these sort of approaches, we start to see many of the perhaps for what we formerly viewed as degraded grazed landscapes as wooded commons and grazed treescapes what I describe as wood pastures in waiting. If we can get the management right, we don't have to do a great deal to actually get these to, to recover in a very positive way. They're also potentially a source of future veterans, which is one of the things I was interested in, uh, because as someone's passionate about ancient trees, we do have a big problem that they are biological living entities and they die, they fall over. Um, so that is a problem. And we need to be thinking, also these, these ancient trees, these veterans that we have today, were generated by cultural landscapes, people in the landscape, hacking and bashing and managing them. And where are the landscapes that are going to produce the new veterans? Well, these potential wood pastures in waiting could be sources of those um, future veterans. And you have to think long term. I mean, I, I'm an environmental historian, so a few centuries is like a bat of an eye, really. We tend to be hooked up on the immediate, particularly with uh, the modern sort of social thing, of social media, etc., and instant gratification through the internet. Um, well, landscape history takes a bit longer. And here, looking across to that view in the distance, uh, you can see a field which has gone through probably um, myxomatosis, riping out rabbits, allowing regeneration, but then there's been grazing put back onto that site. So we've now got a young regenerating site and that could in 200 years time be a quite decent wood pasture. So we need to think about that, think about the roles of these grazing animals more uh, in a more nuanced way uh, and think about where does that take us uh, into future scapes. Okay, we're gonna take a five minute breather there. Um, and then we'll come back just to round up with a few key thoughts and also to look perhaps in a little bit uh, more detail towards future scapes and rewilding. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. Thanks, everyone. Feel free to get a cup of tea. Uh, I've got some. I've got. Hey, what's on to the shorter second part is just to remind you of some basic aspects of history of landscapes and woodland uh, and what we're trying to do we're trying to work out how we got from primeval european landscapes into the modern 20th 21st century what is it we're trying to conserve we also have a context of urban communities severed from working nature and we have the excitement of rewilding futurescapes so we're trying to move from the primeval to the modern and to do that, we go through the Celtic and Romano-British period to doomsday, post-doomsday, as witnessed by the Act of Commons, 1235, then to the medieval, modern industrial, and enclosures and improvement from the 1200s through to the 1800s, but really intensively in the 1700s and 1800s. So this is the, um, the thing that's driving the change in the landscape. And which links to the ecology. And we know about some of this today through legislation at the time. So one of the questions we had was, how do we get from wood pasture to wood? So wood pasture is unenclosed and it mixes grazing animals with trees. And these may be big trees in a park or small trees on a wooded common. So how do they get to be a wood? And you're all familiar with ancient woodlands. You walk in them, you go and see the bluebells there. Well, why are these so special? And you've taken the wood pasture, so there's a few areas which are enclosed 
before doomsday, but most of it is post doomsday. So from that point, the woodlands are being enclosed, the human population is rising, and we get maybe 800 to 1,000 years of management as enclosed coppice with standards. Now coppice with standards is small trees cut to the ground to spring up along with big trees which are um, timber. And what this gives you is two alternating light, light and dark cycles, a boom and bust. A double cycle of the underwood which might be anything from 10 to 25 years and the timber cycle which may be anything from about 40 to 50 years to 120 years. And it's bang, 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 boom, bust, boom, bust, light, dark, light, dark. And what that is doing is removing light demanding species. So the species that can't cope over centuries of that management are removed. And what is left are the woodland indicators. It's a process I've described as ecological filtration. You end up with a suite of indicator species that now tell us we're in a medieval woodland. So these become really interesting and exciting to us. We wanted to fit this into the Vera landscape, the Franz Vera's vision of primeval Europe that set in motion the rewilding movement today. And to do this, we need to understand the past. And we look at the way you get habitat and others, George Peterkin, um, at the 2003 conference. And they agreed that the European landscape, the British landscape in primeval times was a savanna type area with some areas of dense forest, some areas of open land, and there were patches of the two. The other thing I'd throw into the, that equation is a lot of it was much, much wetter than we used to. But we want to see how we get this transition, this transformation. And Doomsday in England is a, the, the key point. It's the watershed, the change from the fluid Saxon landscape to the fixed feudal Norman landscape. And the Act of Commons reflects that. It doesn't make it happen. It actually legislates to acknowledge what is already happening in the landscape. And then the thing which really has stopped us seeing this uh, previously were the parliamentary enclosures. This changes the landscape. It turns it on its head and it removes the bulk of the lowland landscape and turns it into the modern farming that, with which we're so familiar and tiny, tiny bits remain, but most of it is swept away on a tidal wave of enthusiasm for change. Now, remarkably, through all that, there are these, these time capsules of biodiversity through the centuries, pockets of species moving backwards and forwards within the landscape. And it's a bit like a TARDIS, like a time machine. The woodland indicators can take us back in time to look at earlier landscapes and to understand where we've come from. And the ancient primeval landscape was driven by natural processes. People are a relatively minor player in that. And then the medieval countryside, which is where our modern day landscape comes from, was driven by subsistence management. And then modern times, some species survive, some bits of landscape survive to modern times. And these are the precious areas that we now try to conserve in our nature reserves and our protected areas. And we're battling against modernization, cultural severance, modernization, intensification, globalization, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, very challenging. But I just am blown away by the fact that these time capsules of biodiversity have survived. They've come down to us um, and they are there. And it's these biodiversity time capsules looked after by the RSPB and the Wildlife Trust and the Woodland Trust and the others, which potentially are the seed corn for future rewilded landscapes. So these are the areas from which recolonization can maybe occur in a rewilded landscape. What this also means is that we need to reinterpret some ideas of the wide open spaces where I started the talk. This is ringing low bog on the edge of Sheffield. Sheffield is one of the few cities in the world that has a huge raised bog actually within the city boundary. Uh, not many trees, but we now, we now know from paleoecological information that 200 years ago there were a lot more trees in the surrounding landscape. It's just that they've been removed by that process I described of burning, draining, grazing, repeated over decades. So we need to think about this and think about reinterpreting what's happening in these areas. There we see our study area again with the lowlands on either side. This is the Sheffield area, the high moors. And these are the areas that we, where we're trying to reconstruct what's happened in the past. Dead shore wood, we have written accounts of from the ramblers, the 
pioneering ramblers in Hungary. And that wood is almost entirely gone, apart from a few bushes there. And what we're doing, this is an early map produced by uh, some of the records. We've now got far more records, so we could do a lot more with it. But this is just an, an example. This is using some of the GIS uh, technology to produce heat map contours. Um, and basically, we can use the present data to then statistically retrofit species distributions to recreate past landscapes or possible landscapes. So this becomes a really powerful tool to kind of join up what we do know and to try and understand what it's telling us about the past. We can do these really clever um, heat maps. So that's something that we are working on. And the idea is we want to know about future scapes as well as the past. So we want to understand past evolution so it informs present condition and we need to break down some of the barriers of how we see landscapes today and view them through a different lens and that then gives us the potential to guide future development options some future challenges um, we need to be more aware of the smaller veterans that Rackham was so excited about we need to find and recognize the shadow woods we need to protect the remaining sites and better understand the unique management of these areas. These are not woods, these are wood pastures. We need to look at opportunities for new evolving wood pastures in sites that are developing, to take opportunities to reconnect fragmented sites, old and new, and to recognize the potential significance of the shadows as biodiversity time capsules to repopulate uh, an impoverished ecology. So these areas are not woods, which are enclosed coppices, but pasture woods, and they need management that includes at least pulses of grazing. Simply planting trees may have a role in some situations, but what it gives you is a plantation, not a woodland. A woodland takes a lot longer, and it has the, um, the footprint of humanity in it over centuries. So we need to think about that. The pasture woods, the wooded commons, and the shadow woods have historical veracity, and they have resonance to local areas and regions and this can help guide future rewilded landscapes. Just to get an example from North Yorkshire, um, Farndale where I've done quite a lot of work, here we see um, a scrub encroachment as we would have viewed it in times past when I was a bird watcher, wouldn't necessarily be too happy in the trees are moving out across the landscape that way and oh dear is, are we going to have to control them? Well actually these are the shadow woods, these are reasserting themselves. You can find the indicators in amongst them. They've been removed by those processes and we want to keep some open areas, obviously, but these may be really exciting biodiverse uh, pockets. So these can be where um, a new rewilded landscape begins. These are where the biodiversity is. This is the, these are the really rich bits. The White Peak and the Peak District, you might think is a really unpromising landscape for this type of approach. Uh, was very, very heavily cultivated. But if you go back to the 1700s, most of this area was actually covered by extensive wood pasture in what was called limestone heath. And it's just got swept away in the last 200 years. And if we look in the landscape, we can see areas where we might be able to easily trigger a rejuvenation of a wood pasture landscape. And we need to join the gaps, reconnect the bits. This is one of those sites, Hassop, Hassop Park in the Peak District. It's a youngish, um, created park in the 1800s but going through it there are ancient trackways with biodiversity hotspots of indicators bluebells and other species uh, in the hedgerows and the lane sides and these are, are colonizing back into this new wood pasture and it's a relatively easy process just to help on its way and the the alternative is a bit depressing is this is Longston Edge which should be a fantastic biodiverse site and it really is on its knees it's dry it's arid it's overgrazed it's been quarried it's been bashed about it is species poor and it needs to be much much better we could do it so easily we could make this into a better site an example from the lowlands near where I am Sherwood Forest this is Clumber Park couple of springs ago, bluebells all over the landscape. And if we can identify the shadows through the indicator species, we can then set in train with people like the RSPB and the Wildlife Trust and others, a process of reconnecting the bits into future rewilded wood pastures. So I'd argue that the approach 
has relevance, it's useful in future planning, it's predictive, we can actually start to uh, give guidance. We can mesh, emerge, natural regeneration and successful replanting. We can predict where you should maybe put trees and what trees you should put there for maximum effect. And when we manage the natural regeneration, what's exciting as well is that we tend to find they're coming back where they were removed from, which is really, really exciting. There's a historical and ecological veracity. These are landscapes and approaches that reflect local conditions. Massive opportunities for citizen science and community engagement. We've had no research funding at all for this work. This has all been done with local volunteers and we got little bits of funding from the Peak Park and British Ecological Society to develop citizen scientists, which we train up. So that is you know, a fantastic opportunity to engage people really meaningfully in stuff on their doorstep. And we need to think about this idea of woods versus wood pastures, they're not the same. So just to finish with the project that we've had ongoing from the conferences that uh, Robin talked about earlier, we've been running woodland conferences since the early 1990s, uh, woodland and rewilding conferences. And we have a project called Wilder Visions where we talk about unleashing the power of the landscape, working with the grain of nature rather than against it. So Wilder Visions is ongoing and there will be more events next year. Um, just to finish with a few visuals, this is one of the sites near where I am and it's absolutely gorgeous. This is this little bit of scrub, everyone walks past it, the footpath takes you past it and it's where all the insects are, it's where all the birds are. I've had red start here, willow warbler, wood warbler, this year white throat, bluebell, stitchwort, all sorts of things. It is a gorgeous site and it's populated by these small trees but some of them are actually very, very old. That hawthorn could well be 400, 500 years old and yet we walk past it and we ignore it as if it wasn't there. And these are the most fantastic landscapes. When you see those hawthorns, you know they're going to be seated in bluebells and stitchworts. But the bluebell habitats here are far better, far more impressive in many cases than in our wonderful ancient woodlands. So thank you very much for listening. If you want more information, there's more on my blog. Uh, there are loads of freebies to download from the Econet website. Uh, and you can also email me if you have any questions that we don't get a chance to deal with. Thank you very, very much for listening.